Hello everybody and welcome to QSEC's next webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about business insurance. Um, so I hope you're in the right room uh, and we are recording for all our friends who can't make it here today. So just a, a bit of a short um, uh, admi uh, admission from us that we're going to be recording your beautiful faces uh, and all the comments and things. So if you want to remain uh, anonymous, um, please do so by using the chat room and we can uh, ask questions that way. We're very delighted to have Sarah from Aviso Broking here today with us. Um, and as usual, we will start um, our session with an acknowledgement of country. So I'm just gonna bring up our PowerPoint slide. And we'll start from the beginning. Um, so yes, we are going to look at some uh, business insurance today and the great deal that we've got with um, Aviso Broking. So we start our sessions, each session with QSAC with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners. And we're today um, coming to you from uh, Yagara and Turrbal country. Um, and we pay respects to the traditional custodians of the land. But not only do we pay those respects here, we also acknowledge that there's a great deal of wisdom in Indigenous governance and Indigenous business that we draw on through social enterprise. And we share a lot of common ground, actually, in terms of the principles we share and around um, how we do business, how we turn up, and also um, how we trade. So uh, there's an incredible amount that we are yet to learn as well. So we also acknowledge that we're, work we're walking together and learning as we go and talking more about how uh, Indigenous practices from across the globe actually inform and help us to um, connect with our roots and ensure that we're doing the right thing by country um, uh, and also culture. So um, I noticed today that we've got a lot of people on the call who are our members. So welcome members, but really great to see members in the room. And we also have people who are um, not yet QSEC members and why not join QSEC, mm -hmm. I tell you. Um, we're such a great organisation, even if we do say so ourselves. Um, we have Louise here, she's our membership officer um, and she does a great job at helping members um, negotiate all the amazing things that QSEC has to offer um, members, including our wonderful partnership here with Aviso Broking um, to help you navigate um, business insurance because we know that can be quite fraught. So we've prepared a little slide deck for you, like a little extra set of steak knives for you um, to see a bit uh, about what we do um, for social enterprises and some of the high level um, uh, uh, stuff that we do for members. And even members on the call may not even have recognised, oh my gosh, there's so much to learn and so much to do with QSEC, may not even know these things. So there's a directory, an awesome directory listing. And that's to help you um, uh, discover not only um, other businesses uh, that are working maybe in your area um, who might be working in the same sort of industry that you are. Um, we also want to be able to promote social enterprises to a broader um, pool of buyers. So we have this directory listing to help members connect. Um, and you'll find we've got regional pages as well. So you can actually drill down into your regional page to look out if you've got neighbours who are doing same sort of things as you and you can collaborate with but also um, this great directory that lots of people go to. It's our most popular page on our site. People go and find out who are the businesses in my area. And we also represent um, social enterprises at government levels of all governments. So I'm flying to Canberra in a couple of weeks to meet with hopefully the Prime Minister and the Treasurer to talk about what social enterprises do um, and how we can raise their voice across the state and in local government areas as well. We also have a great deal with Social Traders, who's a certifying, a national certifying body for social enterprises. And if you are a QSEC member, you get your first year certification free. And we encourage everybody to have a look at what they're doing with their social enterprise and how they can stand up and really be counted in this great, amazing place that we call social enterprises. Um, and we also often have lots of network events in local areas and in Southeast Queensland, um, for people to come and connect with other social enterprises as well. And don't forget the Learning Centre. Oh my gosh, if you haven't had a look at the Learning Centre behind the scenes in QSEC, if you're a member or an associate member, you get access to amazing free resources with your membership that you can tap into and it's self-paced and you can do at whatever level you're at. We've got courses to support you at all stages of your journey with social enterprise. And I hope our members will be uh, on the call today, uh, back us up with that. 
Um, some of the learning materials have been sourced by incredible people, experts in their field. Um, so please make sure you check that out. But why are we here today? Again, we're talking about um, business insurance and uh, we have this fabulous um, uh, deal with Aviso Broking that really helps to um, understand what your insurance is doing for your business. They'll help you um, provide quotes for um, how you can actually improve what you're doing with your business insurance. Are you covered enough? Um, what are opportunities out there for um, industry partners to be able to get together and, and maybe even make a bit of a case for a particular um, uh, industry grouping as well with social enterprise. And QSET gets a little kickback for that, which we're super grateful for because we are a not-for-profit and all of our profits go back into making sure that um, our members get the very best access um, you can to all of the different business services and things that we have. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah, today. Um, we've got lots of questions about social enterprises. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to share yours. Great. Thanks for having me. Okay. It's just a little slow. Okay, so business insurance is tricky. Um, we know that uh, you don't want to pay for it and you don't want to think about it when you first start your business. You just want to get into it. Um, but it does matter. And um, as you know, with the latest natural disasters that we've had in the last 12 months and COVID, that was also a disaster as well. Um, it's not going to get any better. So we do see um, not many SMEs have backup financial plans in place. Um, and if something did happen because they aren't insured correctly or at all, they'd need to cut spending or limit their lifestyles if they were unable to work or if they had to work more in the business because um, they have lost uh, some of their income. And in the same way, we do see sole traders and small operations from home uh, less likely to insure at all. Um, and it's really important. And uh, I'll go through some different covers, main ones that social enterprises do need or um, you should think about having depending on what you're doing. So if you've never used an insurance broker before, we specialise in insurance and risk, so we can give you tips on how to mitigate your risk. Um, and for example, we'll tell you that insurers won't accept you uh, or will charge more money if you don't have, for example, a first aid certificate um, or if you don't put yellow lines in your car park, as an example, they're basic examples, but we really do specialise in how to help you reduce your risk, which will in turn reduce your premiums. Uh, we identify your individual needs. So I ask a hell of a lot of questions and that's because I wanna know what you do. And it's important, there's no one size fits all in insurance and every business is different and you should be treated that way. And based on the, your individual needs, we'll go out to the market and we'll source all the information and all the types of policies and insurers that will cover you and come back to you and provide those details and understand the fine print so you don't have to. And we explain that in a way that hopefully you'll understand and feel comfortable with what you're buying. Uh, because if you don't know, if something happens and you don't know that you're covered, well, you're not going to claim and you're missing out on a chance to get some income back. So we also provide claims assistance. You'd come to a broker and say, I've just been broken into, I need to claim. And we handle that for you from start to finish. So you can get back to trading and you don't have to stop what you're doing uh, and you can keep earning that income that's most important. And we make sure you get the right insurance. So if you do have a claim, then the insurance is there for you and you'll get paid out. So first coverage, this is only really important if you have a property, you might be renting one, you might have bought one. Also, if you have stock at home, that's an important thing to cover for. Um, so property damage section covers you for fire, malicious damage, accidental damage, storm, flood, floods and opt-in cover, 
So it's really important that if you are in a flood zone to let your broker know, or if you're worried about it um, and you want some flood mapping done, we can help with that too. Uh, impact damage and removal of debris if there was an incident. So here's some examples of claims. The first one, there's a fire that started inside the property and that's a lot of damage from um, obviously putting the fire out as well. Uh, that causes a lot of damage. Second one here on the right in the corner is impact damage. So we see this a fair bit where a truck pulls up to a loading dock or to deliver a parcel and they hit the guttering of a building and they take half the building off and they drive away as if nothing happened and it's up to you to obviously get that repaired. The ones down the bottom, so we've got the water damage. This was not our client's fault and it came in through the flooring from a flooding in the building next door. So while you might think it's okay because next door is covered, you still need to be covered too. So then your insurance company can recover from them but in the meantime, your insurance company will fix the damage and get it all sorted for you so you don't have to worry about trying to claim off the other party. Same with the other photo here. There was a fire in the middle uh, shop, but all other shops received damage. So it's always important to have your own insurance So because even if you're a good risk and you don't have a big fire problem, you never know what's going on next door and if they're looking after their electrics and things like that. If you are just starting out, public and products liability is the insurance that I would recommend you take above all others. There's nice to haves with insurance for peace of mind and then there's you need to have and public and products liability is you need to have regardless of what type of business you are. It will protect you if there was any incident with a person or one of your products. So public liability covers you if you injure or um, injure someone with your words, your property or um, anything in course of your business and the products liability covers physical loss to a property or any damage that you could do at someone else's property as well. And if, the, if you don't have this policy and something happens, they could actually sue you and you would have to then, you could potentially lose your home, you could potentially lose your car and it wouldn't just affect, and, and for something that could cost $500 or $1,000, it's the best insurance you could take if nothing else. So it's, it's definitely the best to take. Uh, some examples, and I'll add one to this because it's, I've had it quite recently and it's a bit funny. So number one, an accountancy practice uh, in the bath season has clients visit their office and one of their clients tripped on a loose piece of carpet and they injured their hip and it caused a lengthy recovery and they sued the accountant and the accountant's liability uh, insurance, engaged lawyers to dispute on the, our client's behalf. And while that happens, the accountancy practice doesn't know what's going on in the background. The lawyers just fight it out and the accountancy practice can go on trading and keep on looking after their clients. Uh, number two, a small business selling toys and silicon baby uh, teething rings at markets was sent a legal letter of demand from a customer whose child had a choking incident on some um, teething ring and business sent that letter to the broker and we lodged the claim and the liability insurers engaged lawyers to dispute on their behalf. So while all this is happening, it, it's paying for your legal fees essentially and there's no out of pocket to you until a claim's finalised and that's just the excess. So the minimum I'd recommend is 10 million uh, because 5 million, I believe you can get out in the market, but 10 million is the minimum a VISO will offer because it's just, 5 million is just not enough anymore when it comes to legal fights. 
and it can be eaten up um, just in the cost of a lawyer and not taking into account any sort of settlement that might have to take place. Uh, the third one that happened just recently to one of my clients, she went to, uh, she was a business coach. She went out to a client's premises and she was sitting in his office and he was the um, CEO and he had a glass table and beautiful um, chairs and everything. And she pushed her chair into the table and the table just shattered and the computers crashed in on itself. And it was, it was just something so simple and such an accident. But this CEO was stressed to the max and you'd think, oh, he'll just say, don't worry about it. But he held her responsible and, you know, it was a couple of grand table and then all the computers on top of that. So we got that sorted as well and all she had to pay was the excess. So just little things that you don't think about um, and just accident accidents happen and it's just about protecting your business. So you know, you aren't losing income or um, injuring yourself <laughs> with um, no protection there. So professional indemnity. Um, anyone who's providing professional services or advice in exchange for a fee. So businesses like your accountants, um, your uh internet, um, website designers, things like that, um, interior designers, graphic designers, counselling, anything that you're giving advice, uh, this is the cover you will need and it covers you if you fail to act in accordance with their instructions or you may provide incorrect advice or accidentally leave out some information or your measurements are a little bit off and it causes an issue where you get sued by your client. Uh, so this is important as well as public liability for those advice giving services. Some examples, uh, a business that provides counselling to disadvantaged Jews in remote areas of Australia is sued by parents of a teen for providing damaging advice, resulted in the teen trying to self-harm and the parents wanted to blame someone so they sued the counselling service because they should have done more and whether or not that is the fault of the counselling service the cover's there to defend and provide the legal costs associated with defending that claim and that claim will go over years and years and years back and forward but as the business they have insurance and they won't even need to get involved unless they need to provide further evidence to support their case. Uh, so that's why it's important. Uh, an immigration consultant filled out an application for their client and it may, had some mistakes in it and it resulted in significant delays and loss of income because they couldn't work because the visa wasn't in play. And so that person... Um, sued or filed an application to sue the immigration consultant and that responded to the claim and then legal I think that was actually settled um, it was a small settlement um, but about a hundred thousand um, but that's something that company did not have to pay out of pocket they were able to pay that under the claim Association liability, this is designed specifically for associations and not-for-profits and it's to protect the individual office bearers and associations. Ooh, I've gone too far. I don't know how to get back. There we go. Uh, to provide in individuals in the association against employment practices, uh, breaches and fidelity. It can also provide any cover for financial um, losses arising out of breaches of professional duty. So this is covering any directors and officers uh, and managers in associations. Uh, some claims examples. Um, 
over three years an employee accountant of a not-for-profit with access to the payroll and trust account they misappropriated $120,000 uh, were, it was reported to the police, but the police were only able to approve to prove that they misappropriated fifteen thousand, and that's because um, when going through the accountants' um, bank details and what they have access to, they could only find the fifteen thousand. But a fidelity claim was lodged, and there was proof of loss for our client. And the claim was paid for 105, so they roughly got back exactly what they lost, which was really good. Um, number two is something we actually see quite often, unfortunately. Um, so, a not for profit organization um, had a complaint made against them um, for bullying, harassment, abuse, and sexual harassment. And it was alleged that the entity had failed to respond to the allegations. So employees uh, had a combined suit and it was lodged with us and the insurer. And after legal investigation, it was proved that um, the association did um, ignore and fail to respond to allegations. Uh, so the settlement was paid. So that is quite common and even if um, you've done nothing wrong or people with a second in the world Australia is to law for lawsuits in that's huge um, people sue over everything now and it's just so so important that when you're trying to do a good thing as a not-for-profit organization that you have cover there so you're not losing income you don't have Cyber insurance uh, protects you from financial impact of computer hacking or data breaches. Um, anyone who has an internet based website or um, business, uh, online shops, uh, definitely should have some sort of cover. Uh, security breaches, you might be actually have to disclose it to the Australian Commissioner within 30 days if you are breaching um, privacy. So it's um, a really big problem. And now the privacy laws have changed. If that is you, uh, it's more important. Some cyber examples, a not-for-profit engage a third party for marketing their organisation. And the third party was breached and data had been lost. So the broker lodged the claim with the insurer uh, who had um, engaged a law firm to check if the privacy legislation um, applied to this client. Luckily it didn't, so they didn't have to um, lodge any incidents there, but they also had the IT um, company retrieve any data that they could and make sure our client's data was uh, safe by putting an extra level of security on. Um, payment was made in re relation to the legal fees. Um, so also if they pay for uh, any ransom uh, and they also pay for investigations and any IT companies to come in and try and retrieve your information uh, if they can, or if not, they pay to get the information reinstated for you too. So it's mainly mostly important for uh, your online services. However, we're all at risk of a cyber incident. Uh, they don't just uh, get the Pentagon and things like that. Um, if they can break into the Pentagon's cyber um, systems, then they can definitely breach all of ours as well so um, and they can get more money out of 20 of us than they could out of the pentagon so um, it's definitely a problem another incident we get quite regularly as well is where um, invoices are sent by email and the details are intercepted halfway through and the invoice um, bank details are changed and payment is made to a scammer um, and then you've got to find out 
which side that happened on. Did it happen on the receiver side or did it happen on your side? So that's a huge one and it's definitely um, something maybe that people would benefit more from using the likes of Xero um, to send invoices instead of just sending your PDF invoices via an email, especially the likes of Gmail and things like that because they're easily hacked. And this is just a list of all the types of business insurance um, you can get and just little explanations of it. So we can get almost any insurance you would need for business uh, and we have access to the London market and insurance at the moment is a bit um, harder to get uh, and a lot more expensive than it used to be because our insurers are insured by overseas insurers and they're seeing our um, natural disasters and they're sort of pulling back their money that they're giving to our insurers. So it is driving our costs up um, and it is making it a little bit trickier uh, for those outside of the box businesses. And that's why it is a great idea to get a broker um, because we do have those relationships in other countries where we can help get insurance that way for you as well. Um, and yeah, any questions? Um, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people complaining uh, about uh, business insurance going up, obviously. And because the market is so sensitive at the moment in terms of uh, getting income coming through, I guess it's really great to have a relationship with um, uh, a broker so that you can sort of go to a wider pool. You can have a look at different um, products and services in the market and see if you can really compare the pair. Um, do you mind just um, stopping sharing your screen and we might um, uh, make it a little bit more like a, uh, a Q&A type panel. Um, you know, I, I know that, um, Asith, I don't want to throw you under the bus, <laughs> but I know that tool libraries and uh, um, areas, there are certain areas that have been really hard to fund or, or to get insurance at all um, for some of our um, industries in social enterprises. Asith, do you mind talking to that for a little bit? I was just about to unmute myself to ask that question, very question. Um, so, yeah, when we sought insurance for our uh, library of things, um, the broker that we're with at the moment said that they could not, in, in fact, they specifically stated in our policy um, that we're insured for everything but the library. Um, and I know that other libraries of things around the country are finding similar issues. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, and I know I, I also owe you a return email so that we can actually set up a time to talk about our uh, insurance at the moment, but interested in your thoughts on um, that whole situation with uh, lending libraries. Yeah, so the risk that insurers see is that they don't, they're obviously mostly secondhand. Um, electrical goods are half the issue. Um, and then once it leaves your property, if someone chops off their arm with um, a chainsaw, for example, and they come back and blame it on you, and they do. <laughs> of course, yeah. And yeah, well, yeah, they do. Or, or if they plug it in and you've had the... Um, the tests on the uh, electrical equipment, testing and tagging, um, but something happens at home and it's their fault, it, you still get drawn into it. Uh, mm. So that's where they see the issue. Um, but I don't think that'll get easier anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, are, are there so ways to, are there ways do you think to minimise yes. that? Because yeah. like, for, for instance, I know a majority of the libraries of things around the country are run um, by volunteers, whereas we're setting ourselves up with a slightly different model because we want to employ people um, from our target cohorts to run it. So it's going to be run by employees. And so are there, do ins will insurance companies look at 
uh, you know, the policies and procedures and things that we have in place and will that make some sort of a difference? Yeah, 100%. So risk mitigation, all you need is a good underwriter, a good broker and risk mitigation. So as long as you have your policies and procedures in place, you get your testing and tagging, you're doing, you know, you've got your hire agreements in place and things like that. We take that to insurers and there's some insurers that don't like outside the box things and there's ones that definitely will look at things like that. Um, but also they're really good at saying, we'll look at it if they put this in place. Yeah. So they can also give advice on what to put in place. But it's no real different to um, equipment hire in your um, situation. Um, so I don't see why we can't get it insured. Mm. Um, but I do like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I think, good, good, good. Yeah, I talk think more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve, for bringing that practical example to us. But I think um, even more broadly, it's the risk mitigation, I think, that we're really uh, wanting to lean into with social enterprise because, you know, a lot of, and, and not just tool libraries, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, risky business in social and cultural and environmental work, you know, where there's, um, you know, potential exposure to uh, the different risk profiles for cohorts that you might work with. Um, uh, some of our um, enterprises are working with highly disadvantaged um, uh, people in some instances, or um, some very complex requirements for um, people with disabilities, or you know some pretty highly complex areas. Which I think some of our members have have spoken to us about finding the level of insurance they require is really challenging because of the because of the hard work we do and we lean into. Um, uh, by nature, social enterprises are really tricky. So, um, Sarah, I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that broader component around risk mitigation and the power, um, you know, of using a broker like you in order to really understand that. Well, it's important if you're starting out in a business to understand what your insurance requirements would be before you start trading, just so you don't go into it um, thinking it's going to be an easy thing. We'll just get a broker. They'll fix everything. They'll get us insurance. Um, but, but, for example, if you're working with highly um, disadvantaged people, uh, do you have first aid certificates? Just as simple as that. Maybe you haven't thought about that. So it's even engaging a broker prior to getting insurance or prior to knowing what your insurance needs are to understand that first. Um, and first aid certificates should be a standard um, for working with, um, well, any, any organisation. We all have um, a first aid person in each organisation. So um, there should be at least someone with that. Um, and we can tell you what insurers want to see. So if you're unsure, and that doesn't cost to come and ask the question, we will give that advice for free. So uh, I prefer to know you're insured correctly than not at all or not with me. I don't mind who's, who your broker is. Um, I just would prefer to know that you're insured properly. Um, so I think while it, you know, social enterprises have a beautiful, um, they give back and they want to get, um, they're so passionate about what they're doing, um, they often forget um, what's needed to keep themselves safe um, going into a business. And that's where an insurance broker can be treated the same way as you treat an accountant, like an essential part of your business, just another chink in your armour of protecting your business and yourselves. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I did want to open it up to anyone else who has some business uh, insurance um, uh, questions. So, um, if you, again, want to remain anonymous, we will just read out your question uh, on the chat. Um, and uh, if you're brave enough, you can pop your video on and um, that'll indicate to us that um, you want to ask a question about something that's worrying you about um, insurance for your businesses. The other thing, as you mentioned in your talk, um, Sarah, is that um, the cost of business insurance is going up. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about um, the way that you are 
helping to see how um, business insurance costs could be mitigated across that larger pool of insurance portfolios. And you touched on it a little bit in the in the um, uh, webinar there, but um, have you got any other insights that you can share with us or examples where you've been able to be successful in, in um, getting those insurance costs uh, minimised? And is it about the insurance company or is it about um, you know, the right kinds of insurance for businesses and making sure that you're maximising your, your spend? It's about your broker getting to know exactly what your business is. So they aren't putting you in the box in the same box as another cafe with five stores and hundreds of employees, um, and they're treating you for what you're actually doing. And um, so it's important your broker understands what you're doing. And like I said, there's covers that are nice to have, but they're not necessary when you're starting out. And it's something to remember that's there in the back of your mind for when you change your business or you add different activities in. Um, but it's important that your insurance is an evolving being <laughs> um, and it starts out maybe as just public liability uh, and products liability. And then when you get a premises, then you need um, property cover. And when you change, and that's why it's important for your broker to ask a lot of questions and get to know your business. So, and tell your broker all the things that you've changed within the year. Um, so when those reviews come around each year, make sure that you're um, responding and providing the information about what you're doing, because that helps with understanding what insurers are going to ensure you for the best premium and the best cover, because there's no point paying for cover that in there, there's an exclusion saying that half your activities aren't covered. Mm. So it's definitely about your broker understanding what you do to its fullest. Um, and there's nothing I love more than going out and sitting down with a client and um, seeing they're insured currently and them looking at their insurance and saying, I had one the other day and um, they were down just at, what did they say? The imported bikes. And that's what their insur the insurance had. And they'd set up themselves online. Looking around the warehouse, they 90% insured, uh, uh, imported and sold yoga equipment, um, the mats, leggings, crop tops. Um, so their risk was drastically reduced because it isn't bikes. <laughs> they might have sold one or two, but it wasn't the 90% of stock that was on the shelves. Mm. Uh, so we were able to reduce that. So sometimes, it, you know, sitting down face to face and really getting to know a business is the best way that you can help your clients. And it also um, helps you understand what we're about as well. And it's all about the relationship, isn't it? I know that um, oh. when I worked with um, PNC's Queensland many years ago, um, we had um, 1,200 plus um, PNC's across um, uh, Queensland and you know vastly they're running social enterprises because they're running you know uh, school shops and uniform shops and bookshops and uh, after school care um, uh, places and all of those sorts of things and it was interesting to hear their stories and some of the activities that they were intending to embark on um, you know varied greatly from what they had already originally been insured for so building the relationship with them, understanding that they've got an event coming up that may be outside of what they're actually being, um, they've been insured for was actually one of the critical pieces of comms that we needed to get out there to make sure that those cover those events were being covered. In the instance for social enterprises, I know we, you know, often we've got very, very diverse industries. Like, you know, we've got everything from coffee shops to law firms, you know, and every everything in between. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the activities from a day-to-day -day of a social enterprise can also vastly change because of the conditions that we work with and the different people that we work with. Um, what's your expectation for people to keep up to date with you in between? Like, you know, we all sign up, okay, we're insured for a specific period of time. It's going to be for a year or whatever that is. What's your kind of um, uh, understanding about how often should you check in with your uh, insurance broker? I mandatorily check in six weeks before renewal, six to four weeks, I'll get in touch, try and set up a meeting if you can, if we're close, um, and go through any changes that have happened within the year. 
But if you ever are going, hey, I'm thinking about hosting this event or I'm going to, I'm thinking of getting this product in, is that going to be covered? Just send emails, give us calls. Um, that's the expectation. Anytime that you need us, we're there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd prefer to do that than assume, never assume something's covered or never assume someone's covered for you. Mm-hmm. Um, always just double check. Yeah. And particularly now, like, you know, we're pivoting like crazy. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's annoying. We're seeing, <laughs> yeah, we're seeing strange things. So um, weird and wonderful activities from, you know, that are varying in just in one business and you go, wow, how am I going to ensure this? Um, but then it's understanding um, the components a bit better and, um, yeah, it's, I'm enjoying the challenge. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <Bring it> <laughs> Um, and there's a, we we ov- uh, obviously work a lot with people in southeast Queensland. Um, uh, you know, a good fifty to sixty percent of our businesses are based in and around Brisbane and southeast Queensland, so out to Sunshine Coast and and surrounds. But we also have about f- close to fifty percent of our members are based in regional centres. And what we're hearing from social enterprises in those regional centres that insurance can be really difficult to to get in some of those places whether that's through you know where they're located or just their access to good services what's been your experience in working with regional um uh social enterprises or just businesses in general yeah so mainly with regional it's a a property issue so it's cyclone based or um weather based is the usual issue um, how far away they are from um, fire brigades. Um, if they've got a country or a metro fire brigade, that's a huge um, issue with insurers when it comes to property insurance. But there shouldn't really be anything, um, any issues with um, liability or things like that. Um, that might just come to a resource thing in their, in their town. Um, but we as brokers work with companies all over Australia um, and social enterprises and other businesses all over Australia. So, um, yeah, it's just about reaching out and finding those resources. But we have a lot of insurers at businesses in North Queensland, um, and it just means that the pool of insurers is actually a lot lower. So there's not as many insurers um, insuring regional areas, um, but the ones that do do it very well. Um, And yes, it's more expensive because you are at a high risk, unfortunately. Um, But then it's about mitigating that risk too. Mm. So, you know, making sure the building's to cyclone code and everything before you move in. Um, That's the property owner's issue, not yours, but it it is going to help you as well in the long run. So it's just about finding a broker that understands the regional um, issues as well. And, um, yeah, but shouldn't be treated any more different from a normal business. It's just that property aspect that can be tricky. Mm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I can see that there's uh, no other questions coming in from the chat. So just one last um, call to people on the on the line. Have we covered off all your questions? I'm hoping we have. Um, as I said, um, Sarah's um, really happy to talk with anyone, uh, uh, if you're a QSEC member, um, uh, you know, it's a really fantastic uh, opportunity to really, uh, let's let's lean in together. Because, you know, from my perspective, the, the reason why we actually started this whole journey was because members were really finding it tough to get good quality insurance at a, at a cost that was amenable to them and allowing them to do the business. Um, in my head, what I'd love to see down the track, and I don't even know if this is possible, I don't even know if it's credible, but what I'd love to see is that we've got a huge pool of social enterprises working together around our industry specifics. So if we've got, you know, 40, 50 cafes who are social enterprises who have the same sorts of issues, um, you know, how do we help businesses have a proper conversation with insurance uh, companies through our broker uh, to make sure that we can really address some of those issues and barriers that we're facing? Can we get a more bulk approach and if that's a national approach even better um, so that we can be consistent across the nation and really help to drive costs down 
in that mechanism. So um, my intention down the track is that we gain, gain some momentum, we pick up some uh, social enterprises um, through this forum and through our partners across um, different states as well to really help us drive the cost of insurance, but also the barriers and the challenges that social enterprises face as running businesses. How do we actually make sensible approaches across uh, all of the different industries that we've currently got? Um, and don't be scared to reach out. Um, like I said, it's free to ask the question. It's free to send me your current policy and I, I can advise you, have you gone back to your broker and asked for this? Or um, I, I can provide you quotes as well, but happy to just provide advice to make sure you're covered correctly. Um, nothing hurts than getting a second opinion and um, making sure that you've got that peace of mind that if something did happen, you are covered. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Sarah, for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And we've have, you know, had some great feedback from members who've used your service already. Um, you know, just thinking, wow, you know, this is a great opportunity for my business to um, understand what's on offer, um, how my business is being insured, uh, what things do I need to, to concern myself about, and particularly in that startup phase, how do I prepare myself best for business insurance down the track? So thanks once again to Sarah. Um, uh, I hope that you will be able to um, uh, uh, make use of her services. I think it's going to be a really fantastic um, opportunity for social enterprises across the board. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. Just a little um, plug for our uh, 10th anniversary this year. Oh my <laughs> God. Um, yes, QSEC is turning 10. Uh, we have a fabulous history pin set up so we can start to collect the stories of how we've um, evolved over time. So um, please make sure that you join in and put your voice um, uh, on this um, fantastic uh, opportunity to showcase what you've done. Um, Pacific, I know you're here. You're one of our founding organisations. Um, you know, it'd be great to have everybody's voice represented on this pin. We are going to have a party um, and it'll be a lovely um, celebration. Uh, we're going to have a couple of different celebrations, actually really understanding the numbers of what social enterprises do and also looking at the impact we've created over time. It's going to be a really fantastic um, journey. If you're a member, you will be invited. Um, it will be a closed uh, uh, invitation only um, session because we really want to honour and respect those who've come on this path with us. So make sure that you scan um, these little things on your screen right now to get your voice added to the history pin and to also stay in touch with us on how you can find up, find out the instructions on how you can upload your voice to that. So um, I'm going to stop sharing now and we're going to close off this session. Um, again, thank you very much for joining us.